Good day and welcome to Glasnost in our time, where we're to try to look at the world rationally in the hope that it will look rationally back. <laughs> I'm your host, Anthony D'Agostino. It's December 20th, 2022. Every day we get more news about the Cold War and much less about win-win globalization. Now it's the rules-based international liberal order against Russia and China. Cold War used to mean a struggle against communism. Uh, this raised the question, raises it for us now, are Russia and China ideological opponents or are they just economic rivals of the United States? Uh, we haven't been discussing ideology very much on Glasnost so far and uh, probably we'll have to do more as we go on. Uh, we haven't talked about different economic models, the uh, contention in the world about economic models and ideology as such. Uh, I usually start with international relations and geopolitics, go into ideas from there, but maybe now we have to talk about ideology in a more concentrated way. And um, a world conflict, not just about the alignment of states, uh, but about contending economic models. And for advice on this, we have David Kotz, one of the most authoritative economists who studies Marxist economics and the economic ideas of Russia and China and has written on them extensively. He's written together with Fred Weir, Revolution from Above, published in 1997. That's a study of the Gorbachev revolution, in my opinion, one of the very best ones. Um, Russia's Path from Gorbachev to Putin, published in 2007, also with Fred Weir. Uh, the Rise and Fall of Neoliberal Capitalism, published by Harvard University Press in 2015. He's taught at the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics and wrote some fascinating articles some years ago on Chinese Marxist arguments for privatization and the extension of, of capitalism throughout China. Uh, so he's a, uh, uh, an excellent person uh, to bring into this discussion. So welcome to Glasnost, uh, David Kotz. Glad to be here, but you might mention my primary uh, academic uh, affiliation, which is uh, a longtime faculty member at University of Massachusetts Amherst. At Amherst. Economics. Indeed, I probably should have said that first. Um, okay, so uh, I'd like to have you talk about all these uh, things you've been writing about, but... Um, Maybe we can start with uh, the Gorbachev revolution. Uh, you and Fred Weir argued that uh, Gorbachev overthrew the Brezhnev regime, which had become by then, you said, a regime of stagnation. Uh, you know, uh, they started to call it stagnation, as I recall, in 1987, as a um, It had become a regime of stagnation, but you also said that the stagnation problem actually stemmed from the economic success of the Soviet era up, up to then. Could you tell us more about that? Uh, okay, uh, the, uh, the argument that, uh, that we made in, in that book, uh, Revolution from Above and the successor book, uh, Russia's Path from Gorbachev to Putin uh, was that the particular uh, model adopted in the Soviet Union in 1928, uh, model based on uh, a very centralized central planning, uh, public ownership, uh, and a uh, and a very top-down authoritarian state uh, was economically effective at developing the country. Uh, it uh, grew very rapidly from 1928 uh, through the mid 1970s. Apart from the World War II period, which since that war was fought to a large extent on Soviet soil. Uh, and in the book, we review the many advances that occurred uh, as a result of that model, which, uh, which I view as a, a mixed system with significant socialist features, but also non-socialist features. Mm. Uh, and uh, in the mid-70s, there was a marked uh, slowdown in uh, output growth, uh, a slowdown in technological progress, and growing social problems. And uh, in, in my view, that was a result of the su successes <laughs> of that development process that 
Well, in the 1920s, the Soviet Union was a, had a rural agricultural economy. Majority of people lived in the countryside. By the 1970s, it had an urban industrialized economy with a highly educated population. And uh, the economy had become far more complex. And the next stage in economic development uh, didn't work well with that hyper centralized form of economic planning. Uh, <clears throat> and with the effects of a top down uh, political structure. Uh, and that showed up in what you know has generally been called stagnation. The Soviet economy was only growing about one to two percent a year after the mid '70s, instead of uh, five percent, six percent a year, which was rapid for that that period. And after ten years of stagnation, from 1975 to 1985, uh, a reformist uh, member of the Central Committee, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, became. Uh, the new leader of the CPSU, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And I, I don't consider the uh, program that Gorbachev sought to enact as a revolution, but rather as a uh, reform, a radical reform. Uh, he, his uh, policies, while they became increasingly uh, thoroughgoing, they did not call for an abolition of the socialist features of the Soviet system. Instead, the, the main parts of the reform agenda were uh, to democratize the state, to, uh, to make, uh, to, to end the controls over expression of public opinion and political views of the people, and uh, to reform the economy, uh, not by privatizing the state on enterprises, but by trying to democratize economic planning to accord a bigger role to initiatives at the middle and bottom of the structure and uh, to introduce some market elements. I don't think that was a wise move myself, but there, were, uh, there was talk about trying to make enterprises self-financing, trying to make pay more dependent on uh, how effective the work was, uh, and how skilled the workers were uh, moving, you know, try and essentially inc increase the uh, inequality of income. Uh, and there were some forms of non-state property, but they, they did not officially call for capitalist property, that is private property with wage labor, but they would allow uh, individual enterprises such as uh, uh, offering a, uh, to repair television sets, uh, uh, household repair services were sorely lacking in the Soviet economy, and to allow uh, worker collective owned and run enterprises in some sectors. David, so that was the reform plan. David, and um, uh, suppose we put this in Marxist terms, uh, say Western Marxist terms, uh, Western Marxist observers of the Soviet, of the Soviet uh, development. Uh, let me see, uh, would you put Alec Nove in that uh, category, by the way? Is, he called himself a, a Marxist, if I'm not wrong, uh, and he wrote authoritative economic history of the... Uh, of the anyhow, it, according to a Marxist way of looking at it, could you say that maybe the Soviet system um, had taken over a backward country and had developed it, and then Marxism, uh, you know, Marxism is not an um, alternative uh, um, to capitalism, it's a successor to capitalism. Let's say, if you ask how the socialist society of the future is going to be developed, under the dictatorship of the proletariat, it's uh, gonna be developed by capitalism. So uh, that didn't happen in Russia and the communist party in a dictatorship had to do that work. Uh, would you say then that um, um, they had accomplished that work? Uh, they had in effect done the work. Uh, Prabrozhensky, the, uh, uh, the economist in the twenties put it exactly this way. He said they had to do the work of the capitalists. Uh, in effect, to develop Russia, that they did a good job with that. And then when they were going to have to take over a system that presumably the capitalists under Western Marxism uh, would have, uh, would have uh, bequeathed them, uh, when they took over this economy, uh, they didn't know where to go from there. All they knew was how to act like capitalists and how to develop an economy. Okay, well, I don't think that applies to the Soviet Union, actually. I, I'm yeah. familiar with that, that analysis. That's not my view. 
Uh, okay, go ahead. Real Brzezinski did not foresee that capitalism would come next. Uh, and that's not what Gorbachev was uh, in favor of. I mean, Gorbachev said, you know, no matter what you do to me, I will not give up on socialism. I think Gorbachev's plan, I think the reform plan of Gorbachev argued that the overly centralized version of socialism had been effective economically, but it no longer was. And in any event, it was problematic in many ways. And that by empowering the working people, uh, that public ownership would show its true advantage over private capitalist ownership. That's what, I mean, I have, I have quotes from Gorbachev in, in the book saying, you know, with that uh, uh, public ownership under socialism has unlimited potential for economic progress. I think that was the core idea. What Gorbachev didn't know was how to make this jump because it was a big jump. So it means democracy. It means the, uh, yeah. the, the democracy dictator shows the proletariat has to be a uh, has to be a democratic system uh, with the possibility of opposition. Right. That's right. I mean, there's, uh, you know, the original idea of socialism that you know certainly one Marx held was that working people would take power, and that did happen in the Soviet Union in the Russian Revolution. Working people in the cities. Uh, made the revolution along with soldiers and sailors. And uh, the, the original idea was it was to be more democratic than bourgeois democracy under capitalism where the capitalist class holds, holds the main power. Uh, Even, but I think it did not evolve that way. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, a small group of high level officials uh, ruled in the name of the working class and eventually the official Soviet position was it was a state of the whole people. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, how can you have the people ruling if they can't read critical evaluations of government policies and have debate about you know, the many questions uh, that arise in a country's economic and social development? So in my view, and I consider myself a Marxist, uh, the Marxist vision of socialism and then communism has the people steering the evolution of the society. And I think that's what Gorbachev thought was needed, was a uh, move of power, economic and political, into the hands of working people, but he didn't have a clue how to do it. Uh, and what happened was uh, he first, the first step, the economic reform was slow, it was hard to do. You know, these enterprises were accustomed to getting their orders from above and following the orders and just fulfilling the plan. It was difficult to activate initiative at the intermediate and low, lower levels, uh, but Gorbachev moved very quickly to lift controls over ex public expression and to build new democratic institutions. You know, they, they created uh, new parliaments that were based on free elections and you could tell the votes were honestly counted because high party officials often lost. Yeah, uh, yeah. The anti apparatus so, anti apparatus vote was was very powerful. Um, so here's here's what happened. Anti apparatus. That that's what Yeltsin was the anti apparatus candidate. Well, that's what he said. But in fact, I think what this did was it led to the development of a totally unforeseen uh, new group, which was a pro capitalist coalition. I mean, there were no capitalists left in the Soviet Union to speak of. Uh, some foreign enterprises operated in the Soviet Union, but it was, it was, enterprises were essentially all owned by the state or were, were communal farms. And there, uh, were, and but, there, there were illegal, in, there were illegal enterprises. And there was an, there was an illegal underground capitalist, uh, uh, capitalist class. They were small and they weren't influential. Gregory Grossman, uh, in the I remember, uh, Gregory Grossman made this argument, didn't he? That it was the criminals, in effect, who came to no, the. No, I didn't. Let's not talk about Grossman. I, I did my. <laughs> I don't exactly. Okay, see go anything. ahead. Go ahead. But anyway, uh, the uh, uh, the place where pro-capitalist sentiment arose most importantly was in the high-level party and state officials, and we document that in our book. By 1990-91, there were uh, objective public opinion surveys going on in the Soviet Union. And here's what they found. They found that among ordinary people, 
capitalism was very unpopular. Anywhere from five to 18% of the public seemed to have a favorable view of capitalism. But among the high level party and state officials by the spring of 1991, when a very good uh, research study was done by a Ohio State political scientist, about three quarters of the high level officials favored capitalism. Only about 25% favored some form of socialism, either the one they'd had before or the one Gorbachev was trying to build. Uh, there were some other groups in the system that became pro-capitalist. The professional economists, I'm sorry to say, became pro-capitalists. And then there was the, as you mentioned, the, uh, the underground capitalists, but they were not powerful enough uh, by themselves to overthrow the party. It was the high level officials that you don't, had the uh, social leverage and okay, that so led to a huge battle. So we've talked about high level officials then who uh, developed an enthusiasm for capitalism at a certain point. Um, and that conjures up um, uh, the, uh, the history of this discussion of uh, Soviet bureaucracy. As you know, um, uh, many opponents of the Soviet regime made the argument that it was a bureaucratic regime right from the, right from the start. And, uh, you know, Trotsky's argument in the 20s was, uh, it wasn't, it was uh, Zinoviev first, and then Trotsky's argument that it was a Thermidorian bureaucracy, a conservative bureaucracy, represented okay, here. especially by Bukharin, and that um, this was always a problem right from the beginning. Do you, by the way, do you endorse this idea that there was this bureaucratic tendency from the beginning? Not exactly in that form, because you know history has a way of refusing to cooperate with the theories that we develop an awful lot of the time. It's a very <laughs> nasty uh, tendency of history. Uh, <laughs> and so the, you know, the, the, the official Western description of the struggle in the Soviet Union during the Gorbachev years was that it was uh, the bureaucrats digging in their heels, trying to protect the old system while Yeltsin was leading a popular movement from below demanding democracy and free markets. But that was not the reality. The reality was the revolutionaries were the high level officials or the counter revolutionaries. They were the ones who had lost any belief in socialism or Marxist ideas and realized that they were not very rich. They were not very powerful <laughs> as individuals. They, you know, power resided in their position in this bureaucratic structure. Uh, and let me give an example, a concrete example. Victor Chernomyrdin. He was the uh, uh, minister of the natural gas industry at the end of the Soviet period. Soviet Union had about 35% of the world's natural gas. He received a modest salary and had a modest living standard. You know, all these stories about the high living of the top bureaucrats, it wasn't really true. I mean, you know, I researched this and they, they had pretty modest living conditions. You know, Gorbachev lived in an apartment with three other families in the building, uh, yeah. each having an apartment. Uh, the, the opulence that existed was in state-owned, uh, you know, uh, vacation homes that a high official could go to, but it didn't belong to them. Limousines that belonged to the office, not to the person. Well, Victor Chernomyrdin, uh, when the dust had settled, and the Soviet Union had been dismantled, then in post-Soviet Russia, Viktor Chernomyrdin emerged as the main shareholder in the privatized Gazprom and a billionaire. That is the typical case. Although the other case was fast operators who had been mathematicians, physicists, whatever, underground economy operators were able to seize the most valuable, many of the most valuable assets. Rent-seeking, rent would you call this rent-seeking? Well, it's, it's property-seeking. They were seeking ownership, not just rent. They were seeking ownership okay. of these valuable assets, which were mainly what the world market wanted from post-Soviet Russia was the uh, the oil, the gas, uh, et cetera. They, they didn't want the, uh, uh, the uh, machine building. Uh, that was competitive with Western capitalism. So, so, so this new oligarchic, 
capitalist class emerged. Uh, that was the revolution, or rather counter-revolution, that overthrew uh, any form of socialism and rapidly began building capitalism. Uh, David, let me ask you something about the dating of this thing. I always took very seriously the um, the 19th Party Congress, uh, 1989. Uh, I think, and, and I think you and Fred Weir said the same thing, that um, the um, uh, stagnation, so to speak, was not an actual uh, decline uh, in the rate right. of growth. It's uh, so a decline in the rate of growth. Uh, there's a growth exactly. that's continuing until uh, that uh, 19th Party Congress, it strikes me, um, 1989 that took the party out of the economy, basically. Well, it and didn't really it happen. By a guy named Abel Agenbegian. Yeah. Uh, and he made the argument that when the party was taken out of the economy, that it would liberate uh, <laughs> the spontaneity of the, of the worker and uh, they would, and production would go way up. It was being held down by uh, the party and planning and state direction and all the, re all the rest of that. And um, uh, the opposite happened. Uh, um, uh, the, the regime ended up uh, all the um, all the um, um, connecting connective t tissue of the regime broke down, and you ended up with a regime of local embargoes, basically. And yeah. the decline, and the economic really decline, really I think, begins in 1989. Uh, it begins in 1990. Similar to that, it begins in 1990. It begins in the summer 1990. of 1990. Okay, uh, because that's when. Central planning was, uh, they started dismantling it. And, uh, and it was a crazy argument. And the more sensible high level uh, specialists knew this. Uh, Agenbegin didn't, but others did. Uh, and so what do you do when you have a system that's that has gone on for many decades with uh, uh, central planning and public ownership and suddenly you say, okay, we're gonna remove the system that guides economic decision making, we're going to announce that the enterprises are going to be privatized, but no one knows who's going to own them. And then there's going to be prosperity. Insane. Only one of the dumbest arguments you could possibly imagine. What would happen? Collapse. Collapse, and behold, yeah. it was collapse. Yeah. No one knew what to do. Uh, at the same time, the Soviet Union was taken apart by Yeltsin because his only path to sovereign power was in the Russian Republic. Gorbachev was blocking Yeltsin from taking over in the Soviet Union as a whole. So he was able to maneuver to, with a few, with the uh, heads of the two other Slavic republics, Belarus and Ukraine, to take apart the Soviet Union with the Communist Party chief in Ukraine and Belarus becoming the new heads of state there. Uh, and so that broke, you know, the Soviet economy was totally interlinked across Republican borders. and. They had an eight year long depression. Uh, it was a disaster. You know, they didn't realize that this, I mean, the, you know, the, the Western economists thought this was a great idea, this sudden rapid shift. Although, you know, frankly, some of the more knowledgeable ones recommended the shock therapy uh, method of getting to capitalism because they wanted to privatize as rapidly as possible even if they knew there would be huge economic costs, because mm -hmm. that would, they thought, prevent a return to uh, socialism. Okay, but a little footnote before we desert uh, Agen Begian's argument about uh, the uh, spontaneity of the workers and all the rest of that, that's based on the notion of um, socialism having created, this is a kind of philosophical point here that I'm bringing up, not exactly an economic point, but, um, uh, that's predicated on the idea that socialism has transformed the personality of uh, the worker uh, to such a degree that you have such a thing as Soviet man, you know, and, and, and Soviet man is fighting for socialism at the point of production and et cetera, et cetera. And the Cubans, uh, uh, Che Guevara really put a lot of emotional capital into this idea, <laughs> capital, into this idea. Uh, that uh, that uh, the personality uh, had been transformed under so that's a lot of rot, don't you think? Uh, the uh, the workers no, the personality had been transformed, but in the wrong direction. I mean, but in nineteen seventeen, workers are workers are workers everywhere, right? They no. are they uh -uh. are interested in economic incentives. That's the main thing, right? No, no, no. Oh, okay, no, go ahead. For that, I think uh, human beings are complex, and they have complex needs and wants. And on the one hand, people need, you know, food, clothing, housing, et cetera. They also want uh, respect and admiration. 
and appreciation for their contributions. That's very powerful uh, incentive. Uh, and I think what happened in the Soviet case was that in the Russian revolution, the workers exercised enormous initiative. They overthrew one of the most powerful regimes in the world. You know, they went up against armed soldiers and got them to join their side. And, you know, they took over the factories in 1917. But the way the Soviet version of socialism worked, it disempowered workers. It uh, socialized them to just follow orders. That the role of the worker in the Soviet enterprise was to follow the directives from the director so as to fulfill the plan. And there were economic incentives, but they reinforced that kind of behavior. If the plan were fulfilled, then they'd get a bigger bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I met Soviet workers in 1991 and uh, Russian workers in 92 and 93. And they're the, uh, the, the workers that I met had basically, they were very angry at what had happened. They knew they'd gotten screwed by the transition but they thought the role of a worker was to, was to carry out the plan that was given to them. Uh, and I think that was a problem that socialism in the Soviet Union on the whole failed to uh, energize the initiative of workers. Although there were exceptions, there were some cases, there were some enterprises that did uh, activate their workers better, but the power was always in the hands of the director in that system. Uh, and Gorbachev had the idea of trying to activate the workers. I think it was a good idea. I don't think workers are the same everywhere. Uh, you and I have probably worked in organizations where people took initiative, uh, progressive organizations that are uh, run by the people in them. I think it's mm -hmm. possible, uh, but uh, it, no, it but didn't just have- the same, Just the same, David. When I think of incentives, I think about economic incentives. Uh, workers are not there uh, uh, for the joy of it. Uh, they're not there uh, to uh, pursue some higher ideal, except they, of course, they can be, be appealed to as anyone else can. But the main thing, the main reason why they trade their labor for wages is uh, to gain the necessities of life. And uh, that's the same all over, isn't it? Wait a minute, isn't that Marxism? No, I don't think so. Oh, I think go ahead. Tell, uh, go ahead. If that were true, then forget about socialism. I mean, you'd never get it. And I think that Marx's concept of human nature is people have uh, have complex needs that both involve self-interest and caring for others and uh, uh, being able to act as part of a group, part of a collective. And non-economic non you know, motives then. Well, the, I wouldn't say economic equals self-interest because economic has to do with producing goods and services. Okay, and goods and services can be produced by people just doing what they think will benefit their individual self. But in a collective production process, that can be very destructive. You know, workers in a modern uh, industrial setting have to work together and they have to cover for each other. Uh, if they just think of themselves, uh, it wouldn't work. Uh, so there's a mixture, even in capitalism, of uh, collective behavior and individual oriented behavior. In fact, in the neoliberal era uh, in capitalism after 1980, uh, there was much more of an emphasis on individual self-interested behavior. And in many sectors, it brought disaster, particularly in the financial sector, where for example, financial institutions, instead of operating to achieve some end for the organization as a whole, individual traders were told, go make as much money for yourself as you can. And it brought us the 2008 financial crisis where institutions collapsed. So even capitalism, this is a point Marx makes, that capitalism tends to uh, promote uh, collective consciousness by workers, not just individual consciousness. And that socialism is supposed to rely heavily on that. That's my understanding. Not and that I guess socialism out of this collective uh, this Workers collective would... consciousness uh, comes their political sense, huh? Yeah, and there was some of that in, in the Soviet Union. I mean, uh, in the 1930s, there's evidence that many workers accepted a low living standard because they believed they were building something for their children and for future generations. Mm. 
And they did. Their children lived a lot better hmm. from their sacrifice. Uh, and uh, people worked hard in the Soviet Union, believing that they were contributing to building up a new society. No doubt, no doubt. Despite the, despite the problems and distortions, I think that was a reality. Okay, well, then how about the intelligentsia then? The intelligentsia made a market choice, uh, you could say, uh, in the uh, Gorbachev reform period. And uh, the intelligentsia, you know, there are some people, there's a whole theoretical literature, and I made a, I wrote about this a lot myself, uh, the writings of a guy named Václav Mahaisky, um, who argued that uh, really the social democratic movement was not really a workers' movement, but a movement of the intelligentsia. And um, you know that a great deal of Soviet writings in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s started to argue that the real worker that we are producing in the Soviet Union is an educated person. We, we want them to go to college and et cetera. So when we talk about the, the working class, we're actually talking about educated uh, society, almost defining uh, the working class as having been transformed by socialism uh, into the intelligentsia. But at any rate, this intelligentsia in the, uh, in the Soviet Union, it made a, a market choice. Uh, does that mean well, that, that wasn't the educated workers that you know the intelligentsia in the soviet case was uh, i mean it was really so you think about very people, very the people who make their living by rent seekers. Uh, creating <laughs> images uh by uh playing with ideas uh you know uh, academics writers artists you know that was the relevant intelligentsia in the soviet case and i do have a chapter of of the book uh, about the intelligentsia, the radicalization of the intelligentsia. And <clears throat> we argued, because I, I met a lot of them uh, <laughs> in my research, uh, given my own class background, that's who I tended to meet a lot of them. And uh, uh, I think intellectuals uh, tend to be attuned to social problems and they tend to be attracted to radical solutions. Under capitalism, that tends to make intellectuals uh, move toward the left and be critical of capitalism. Uh, in the Soviet system, I think intellectuals had a particular problem that I think the, the craft of an intellectual leads to a desire to be free, to construct ideas and images as you wish, as your creative self creates. And instead, they faced party officials who knew nothing about their craft, who were telling them what they could do and couldn't do, and they really resented it. And they tended to view uh, the free marketplace of ideas under capitalism, which is, of course, limited in various ways. They tended to, to think, gee, that sounds pretty good. Uh, and so they were attracted to the market because they wanted individual freedom to express their own ideas. And uh, also, not the, just uh, not just uh, uh, vacations in Europe and uh, well, then there's that. Then there's you know, <laughs> as the Soviet Union opened up more, you know, they met Western intellectuals who were not uh, cross section. They didn't meet the Western intellectuals who, you know, <laughs> the, the would be actors who worked in waiting on tables, yeah, trying to survive, yeah. <laughs> the writers who who starved <laughs> while trying to make the. They met the the, the rich ones. <laughs> they thought, oh, wow, intellectuals live a lot better under capitalism than, yeah. than we do here. Uh, they, you know, they, they were relatively privileged. But by the way, the economic privilege of intellectuals in the Soviet Union decreased from the end of World War II through the 1980s. You know, the ratio of their income to that of the average worker declined over time, and they resented it. I mean, I heard, you know, Russia... Soviet intellectuals saying, do you know that next door to my dacha, because every urban Soviet had a, had a vacation home in the countryside, could be very modest. Uh, my dacha, next door to my dacha is one owned by a truck driver. Isn't that outrageous? It's just as nice as mine. Well, well, it's, it's to each according to his work. Not to each according to his means, or wait, to his <laughs> well, needs. Excuse the me. The problem is that the Soviet system was increasingly valuing production workers' work and valuing the intellectuals less, less over time. Less. And boy, less. did they resent that. They yeah. resented that. The dictatorship of the proletariat. Yeah. 
Well, so uh, <laughs> I'm for okay. democracy, not dictatorship, actually. But anyway. Okay, the, okay, uh, okay, democracy. That's all right. I mean, you all know right. what dictatorship means in English. It means an arbitrary rule with no checks on it. Yeah. So well, I'm for um, rule by the working class. Okay. Okay. So um, economic decline just at the end of the Gorbachev period. Um, that was a result I said, of. I said 1989, you said 1990. Okay, okay. So yeah. economic decline about then. Starts in 1990. Starts before, at any rate, before shock therapy. Minor decline. The decline, decline already set in before and shock then begins to collapse in 91. Yeah. And shock, shock therapy, a horror of horrors. In 92 to, yeah. to 97. The Russians are trying to become capitalists. Uh, but you say that was blocked, that Russia could not become, you say, uh, you and Fred Weir, you say um, uh, uh, Russia could not become a proper capitalist society. It, well, it, it was, was evolving toward capitalism, but through a disastrous transition process that destroyed the uh, economic assets. Uh, you know, Russia had a lot of uh, industry that could have, could have gotten to world class, and some were world class. But they they couldn't get credit. Uh, they, they they couldn't get assistance for uh, for the changes they needed to make to function suddenly in the capitalist world market. You know, I interviewed enterprise directors at uh, uh, you know an optical company at various companies that that wanted to uh, become more effective so they could compete in the world market. They couldn't get credit. Uh, they didn't they, they didn't know how to market their stuff because they never had to do it before. Yeah. And so they just withered. So, so, so I'm saying it was an unsuccessful transition to capitalism. Although it did produce a distorted yeah. form of capitalism. Private privatization then was not enough, you think? No. Hmm. No, I mean, you know, you know, the, new, uh, a new capitalist I mean, uh, enterprise. One factory that had recently bought all these uh, Western made machines. Uh, very efficient, cutting-edge machines to process timber. Uh, an oligarch took it over and turned it into a warehouse for timber and sold the machines for scrap. That's what happened. This huge destruction of valuable economic assets because the profit motive was dictating all these screwy things that were harmful for the economy as a whole, but the way to make profit in that milieu. Yeah. Okay, maybe we should talk about China because the transition was I was going to say, uh, you make the same argument about China that it's not a question of uh, privatization. It's, a, uh, you know, it's not a question of the, the old um, state-owned enterprises and all the rest of that. It's new enterprises, you say. Yeah, China underwent a very different process. And uh, so shall we talk about that a little bit? Let's do, let's do. Okay. Uh, in, uh, in 1978, the post Mao leadership made a surprising decision. I mean, you you know, you might have expected, given the history of Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping had been thought of as advocating more of a Soviet model as against Mao's more freewheeling uh, approach to trying to build socialism. There was a lot of chaos in the Mao era, uh, but Deng Xiaoping uh, did not opt for following the Soviet model. Apparently he was very impressed by some of the uh, Asian tigers, which had been growing very rapidly through a kind of a state guided capitalism. And uh, he called for uh, introducing the market and opening to the global economy. And I visited China in the mid eighties for the first time and met with party people. And here's what they told me, they said, we made a mistake by introducing full public ownership and full central planning too early because we were not developed enough to do that effectively. And we need to take a step backward to introduce what they called commodity money relations, that is market relations. And we're not talking about privatization at that point, just introducing the market. And they said that will accelerate the development of the forces of production and we'll get to communism uh, sooner. That was the argument. Uh, and uh, it did accelerate their economic development. I mean, who was the thinker who said, 
that competition in markets can bring economic progress. It was Karl Marx in Capital and the Communist Manifesto earlier uh, that competition among capitalists for profit does bring technological advance over time and a certain kind of efficiency. Didn't they, uh, cite, uh, didn't they cite the experience of the NEP? You know, Andropov uh, did. Uh, he talked about the NEP. Maybe yeah, maybe but then they distorted still some it. Lessons, he said, still some lessons that the NEP could do. Yeah, but the story. NEP was taken as a step backward and it was done for six or seven years. In an and they economy. said, we're stepping backwards because we don't have a choice because yeah, the economy has yeah. been destroyed. We'll have to let foreign capitalists come in. We'll the, let the some peasant, develop the peasant domestic capitalism talks. develop, but you know, we're not going to, you know, this, we're going to end this as soon as we can and go to socialism. But under Deng Xiaoping, this, this was an, in, became an indefinite idea. So for the first decade in the 1980s, there were still no domestically owned capitalist firms, but they, they did two things. <clears throat> they allowed new uh, enterprises to emerge owned by uh, townships and villages that would not be part of the uh, central plan, but they would uh, buy inputs from uh, state-owned enterprises, central state-owned enterprises, and they could produce for the market. A lot of them started producing for export. I, I visited a uh, township in China in 1986 that was producing uh, plastic bags to put shoes in for export, a great, a great decision. And they bought the machines, and the uh, materials they needed from state-owned enterprises at con low controlled prices. Mm -hmm. And then they, they sold them to exporters and mm -hmm. made a big profit. They were, uh, mm -hmm. the, the people in this township had stopped doing farming and they were working in this enterprise and the, and the communist party secretary for the township was the director of the enterprise. And mm -hmm. out of the profits, they were building a new community center and the director was building a seven room house for himself and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for 10 years, there was very rapid growth, about eight, eight or 9% per year GDP growth. At the same, the second part of that was the state owned enterprises were allowed eventually, once they met their quotas to, if they could produce more, they could sell it at market prices. So that created an incentive for the state-owned enterprises to see if they could produce more than the uh, than what the plan required them to produce. So it kept all the basic goods being produced that people needed, but it created incentives for uh, centrally state-owned enterprises and for new local government-owned enterprises to produce for the market. And they allowed some uh, foreign investment, although there wasn't much at first. Then uh, in 19, in the early 90s, they made another big change. They started allowing uh, privately owned enterprises. Uh, Deng Xiaoping pushed that in his, in his Southern tour, where he said, we have to move faster. And uh, they, uh, they decided that, uh, that there was a, a, uh, another force of production, which they called entrepreneurship, which really meant capitalists. They, they uh, validated uh, capitalists within the economy. And very rapidly, uh, new uh, uh, enterprising individuals started new private companies that grew very large and produced Chinese billionaires. And many of the state-owned enterprises were privatized in the 1990s. And they brought them into uh, the and their party. employees and their employees thrown out of work, mass unemployment among the uh, state owned enterprise workers. And then eventually, then there was a huge battle over bringing uh, so called entrepreneurs into the Communist Party. It's ironic. You know the, the term party, entrepreneurs? Yeah. In, I learned from my uh, graduate study of economics in the US that the term entrepreneur was introduced in. Western economics as a euphemism for capitalists. It sounded better. Well, the Chinese took that. They learned from, from the world market that, hey, this is a good, you know, you know no yeah. capitalists here, but we, now we have entrepreneurs. Uh, so um, so uh, uh, with the capitalists in the party then, uh, 
how do you think that affected the ideological discussion? I know, you know, you're not an insider when it comes to things like, nobody can be an insider when it comes to things like that, but um, did you get any inklings of that idea that, yeah. that there, there were capitalists in the party who were making Marxist arguments for capitalism? Well, everyone had to make Marxist arguments uh, yeah. in order to be heard because yeah. the official discourse, but I learned that Marxist arguments can be twisted to into pro-capitalist arguments. But I don't think, you know, the uh, the capitalists who got into the party were not running the party. Uh, the high level officials, the party was a very top-down organization. The, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the general secretary of the party is a key figure, but this it has not just been a one person rule. It's been a broader high level officialdom. But, they, but don't they have private? Don't they have private fortunes? All these top party? No, members? not the individuals. No, they're, they're, some of them have family members that have fortunes. I don't think the high-level officials themselves uh, have been able to own uh, a lot of wealth. But they're, some of their family, you know, their siblings, their cousins, in some cases their spouses, uh, uh, were owners. But I, I don't. Uh, I think the high-level officials were not being controlled by a capitalist class. Uh, I think there's a, I think if you look at the data from, uh, I'll just cite some data for you, from 1998 to 2018, the share of industrial employment in the state sector went from 60% to 18%, the rest of it private. Uh, China's economy went from uh, what I call state socialist to capitalist. But I don't think the state became a capitalist state. A normal capitalist state is controlled by the capitalist class. And I don't think the China's capitalist class, while it's wealthy and influential, I don't think they control the state. Uh, you, don't think think it ever, you don't think it ever teetered between Capitalism and socialism, like say between 2000 and about 2008? Well, it gradually evolved from a socialist. I mean, according to Marxist theory, you know, there's, a, there's an economic aspect of society, a political aspect, and a cultural or ideological aspect. Okay. And the economic aspect in China evolved into a capitalist economy, but the state did not evolve, has not yet evolved into a capitalist state controlled by the capitalist class. You know, there are plenty of cases in the world, think, what do you in think world Marx history. What do you think Marx would have he, said about that? What do you think Marx would have said did. about that? He did. He said, reality is complicated. And there are cases where the capitalist class doesn't control the state. Some powerful individual controls it. Uh, and there are many, this Marxism is not mechanical uh, economic determinism where Capitalist economy, therefore capitalist state. It's more complicated than that. Uh, look at uh, Japan. In Japan, a section of the feudal ruling class decided in the uh, late 19th century, they were gonna build capitalism and they fought a civil war. They took over the state from another section of the feudal ruling class and they built capitalism. They built capitalist enterprises. They turned through the state, they turned them over to private owners, but a class of state bureaucrats exercised uh, control over the capitalist class for a long period of time. South Korea, the military uh, developed South Korea's capitalism and rode herd over the capitalists. You know, if they violated the, uh, uh, the regulations, uh, they could be executed. One could say this is a German model. Uh, Werner Zombart uh, said that the uh, aristocracy runs Ger Imperial Germany uh, the bourgeoisie uh, participates <clears throat> economically, but not politically. Well, eventually the bourgeoisie got control. Entirely. Eventually, the bourgeoisie got control in Germany. Oh, but and you, com you <laughs> compare Imperial Germany uh, to the Tigers yeah. and to, to China, do you not? Well, it's not the best case in my view. But anyway, the uh, <laughs> the okay. uh, the point is that that is what Marxism says is that's an unstable combination. That a uh, yeah. configuration that involves a developing capitalist economic base and a state controlled by some other group, which could be the military. You know, Ataturk in Turkey is another example who advanced Turkish capitalism uh, and controlled the capitalists. Uh, mm -hmm. 
So some, or it could be a communist party controlling yeah. the state. Yeah. It's not stable in the long run. So as the capitalist all... class gains wealth and power, it's going to contest for state power. And it resents being controlled by a state that's in the hands of someone else and tells them what to do. So are all those uh, status models kind of uh, converging and getting all mixed up now? Uh, well, I'm just saying they're not stable. Where they're exactly going to go is hard to predict. I mean, I, and take China. I don't think China is stable today. I think Ch there's a huge tension between a lot of angry workers and peasants, uh, a very rich capitalist class who's been just doing great, although they've had some problems lately with a state that's become more overbearing toward them, which they don't like. Uh, and a communist party leadership whose aim seemed to be to steer this mixed model toward the world technological and economic frontier uh, and increase living standards. I think that's what I, I think Xi Jinping represents a faction of the Chinese leadership that wants to maintain this uh, capitalist economic base with uh, a socialist state as they see it. Uh, that they think works the best for development. And actually it does. It, it does produce the fastest development, economic and technological, in my view. And that's one reason why the US ruling class is so worried about it. They're afraid China's got a better model there for economic progress. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, But where it will go, there's another faction of the leadership, very influential, that's neoliberal, that worships what they think of as the US model, that wants to... Uh, go to what they see as a free market model. And that's a, still a very powerful faction in the party leadership. I think there is also a social democratic faction hmm. uh, led by Bo Chi Lai. Bo Chi Lai, yeah. Uh, he wanted a more worker-friendly version of the Chinese model. Uh, it wouldn't have been my version of socialism, which is bottom-up power of working people but it would have still been a top-down model, but one that was more attuned to meeting the needs of working people. And I think the neoliberals and the statists united against him and zapped him. You can uh, argue uh, all of them have to do this through a kind of a super Maoism. And um, uh, can't all of them uh, get more or less the same thing out of the Mao uh, a legacy uh, uh, for their various positions? Mike Mao had this idea he wanted to empower the people. Uh, and, you know, he never quite figured out how to do it. But uh, but I think he did want, I think that was Mao. I think Mao's Cultural Revolution was, he, he saw the formation of a ruling class of bureaucrats and he wanted to prevent that. He wanted to empower working yeah. people. It didn't, yeah. it didn't work out. Yeah. Instead, yeah. instead, it produced a lot of chaos and <clears throat> angered the party bureaucrats who came back to power. Yeah, but he wanted to. He also wanted to break China from Russia, and wanted to defeat all those people in um, in China who, uh, well, he, he saw who felt they had to stick with Russia no matter what. It's a there was a uh, an international yeah, problem too, don't you think? Uh, there was a the whole problem of their claims about Russian encirclement. They were angry about uh, uh, all the Russian uh, gains, Castro and uh, Brezhnev had made all these gains in Africa. The Chinese were very unhappy about that and. In fact, the Chinese were against all, uh, essentially, all the revolutionary things that happened in the 70s. That was a very so negative. They were Soviet. They called it all figure. Soviet encirclement. I know. I thought that was a disaster. I thought that was a big mistake for China. But that's another uh, so Some people have argued that's one of the big reasons why the Soviets fell. Do you, do you take that view? No. Okay. I think the Soviet. I think the Soviets fell because Gorbachev's radical reform plan ended up empowering a pro-capitalist coalition. Mm -hmm. that uh, came to power. Yeah, the, fail, uh, the failure of uh, failure of Glasnost, would you say that? Well, a failure, you know, Gorbachev could have uh, stopped Yeltsin from coming to power. He had the power to do it and he wouldn't exercise it. The, there, I mean, Yeltsin was violating one law and constitutional provision after another in his maneuvering to dismantle the Soviet Union. And there was a conversation between Gorbachev and the Minister of Defense in the fall of 1991. He was a military official 
uh, in which Gorbachev said, you know, if Yeltsin were arrested, it would solve a lot of problems. And the defense minister said, but Mr. President, if I were to do that without your explicit order, that would be treason. And then he looked at Gorbachev, obviously waiting for Gorbachev to give him the order because the military hated Yeltsin and where he was leading yeah. things. And Gorbachev mm -hmm. said, well, I was just speaking hypothetically. Well, yeah. Gorbachev was hoping the general might do it. And then he could see what happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he didn't, he That's was unwilling, <laughs> he was unwilling, uh, unable to yeah. use the state power, which was legitimate state power, to stop Yeltsin from taking the Soviet Union apart. He wouldn't do it. And so Gorbachev, so Yeltsin defeated him. And wow. Um, I, I think there, let me just, there's one more ahead, path. I think it's, there are people in the uh, lower and middle levels of the Communist Party in China who would like to return to building a genuine bottom up people's socialism. They're far from the levers of power, but they exist. And there are, you know, leftists, there are real socialists and communists among young people and uh, uh, various parts of the Chinese population. So uh, it's unclear where China is going to go. Could be, could, I think be they, could be a revolutionary situation. It could. It's possible. Uh, I think China could end up, the neoliberals could end up taking power at some point. Mm -hmm. I think what's happened with COVID is it seems to have weakened Xi Jinping. Maybe the neoliberals will uh, rebound and be able to take full power. I think that would, would lead in a... Uh, a Russian direction of economic collapse if they did, and that who knows what would come next. Uh, I do think that Xi Jinping's statist path is the most uh, uh, economically successful one at this time, although eventually uh, there's going to be a problem with growing power of capitalists who, who don't like being told what to do and restrict yeah. it. Yeah. Capitalism is um, a problematic system because it works best when there's a significant degree of central direction, but the capitalists hate it. They hate it, yeah. It's, yeah, exactly. Um, you um, say though that um, uh, this um, Cold War with uh, China, this wouldn't be good for American workers at all. And you, no. uh, you say there can still be a win-win kind of compromise uh, strategy that can be pursued vis-a-vis -vis China by the United States. Win-win, you say. And um, you say it's, uh, it can accomplish through trade negotiations, uh, some kind of, uh, what's the word, a detente of some sort. It's not in the cards at the moment. I mean, you know, one of the most uh, important parts of Marxist theory is the theory of imperialism. And boy, we're seeing that today, that, you know, my understanding of Marxism says that powerful capitalist states have a strong imperialist drive to control as much of the world as they can so that their capitalists can extract the maximum economic benefits from uh, involvements beyond the country's borders. And the US has been the global hegemon in the capitalist world since it took over that position from Britain after World War II. Uh, it was actually an interwar period when there wasn't clear there was any hegemon, it's chaotic. Uh, Britain was hegemon until World War I. It was still uh, the, it was still Britain in terms of diplomacy, though. Yeah, but, okay. but they, they were no longer strong. Okay, so so the U.S. I mean, it, there's a real irony in the U.S.-China relation, right? The U.S. advisors said to China, "Marketize your economy, open up to the global economy. We know that you will develop much more rapidly that way." And then, to their astonishment, that's actually what happened, and. Before they knew it, instead of China producing cheap toys and clothing, uh, they were producing high-tech products that were competing and threatening to compete with core US <clears throat> industries. That's not what they wanted. And I think that's what's driving the Cold War. And they say it. They want to stop China's technological development. They claim China is aiming to dominate the uh, key industries of the future, but they lie through their teeth. China is not seeking to, they cite this made in China 
2025, 2030, I forget which, which it was, uh, that they say was a blueprint for China to dominate all the key industries of the future. Well, try reading it. I read it in English and the word, the concept of domination never appears. It says that China's aims are to uh, move toward the technological frontier in key industries, to improve the efficiency of Chinese industry and to improve the environmental uh, performance of China's economy. It was a really reasonable policy for economic advance, but to the global hegemon, the prospect of a potential equal means you're gonna be dominated. It's either dominate or be dominated. That's how imperialist thinking goes. And so they believe China is a threat, but really China's system is not impelling them to try to dominate the world because they don't have a capitalist state. Hmm. And I think that the Chinese diplomatic argument that we want to uh, work together with Western companies and Western governments in technological development and in solving world problems, I think they actually mean it, not because there's something virtuous about China and evil about America. It's a matter of modes of production and nature of states. Uh, how about the United States? You say a Cold War and a, um, a liberal democratic policy, kind of like the Rooseveltian New Deal or something like that, uh, that they won't match, or that, that's not the word, mesh. Uh, they won't to work together. Why, why is that? Uh, some people would argue that in the 30s, that's exactly what we had. Uh, we had a very rambunctious foreign policy, heavy defense spending, military Keynesianism, some would say. And um, we also had a relatively liberal uh, government. Uh, why won't that yeah. work uh, today? Well, I have to admit you have a point because the, the period in the 1950s and 60s of a kind of a mild social to democratic process on domestic policy in the US was also associated with very aggressive imperialism, <coughs> many military interventions. And I think we're seeing that with the Biden administration. On the one hand, the Biden administration surprised a lot of people by uh, pushing uh, significant social democratic economic policy initiatives uh, domestically while uh, doing Trump one better in aggressive assertion of US imperial interests around the world. I do think it creates a strain when you look at this 800 some billion dollar military budget, it makes it very hard to afford the uh, social programs. Uh, so there, I did in an article that you uh, clearly had read, I mentioned that that's a tension, but unfortunately today, there's almost no, no strong opposition to the developing Cold War policies of the US government. The Republicans and Democrats are almost all in on it. It's sort of like, like the, uh, the 1950s, you know, before the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War opened up opposition to US foreign policy. And I'm hoping that it's going to develop, but it's gonna take a while to build it. Well, um, I'd love to continue this discussion into the night, yeah. uh, but we- have we, we already are doing that actually. Have here. We, have we, <laughs> here in the Eastern have time we, zone. Have Dark we time to continue. We could uh, get the sum of our and, and uh, have a, a glass tea and uh, talk into the night about, about this stuff. Um, but um, I guess we have to conclude. Uh, thanks yeah. so much. Thanks so much to uh, uh, David Kotz for a fascinating, illuminating discussion. I hope it's not the last one that we that we have. Um, and I have to say goodbye now. Uh, okay, and thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed okay. it. And, uh, and goodbye to uh, all the uh, Glassnosed uh, viewers. And uh, until next time, uh, when we will continue to ask the question, uh, after we have uh, tried everything else, uh, uh, why don't we try thinking about it?